And thank you for joining us today for Hoarding Disorder 101, the reality versus what you see on reality TV. Today, we're gonna to be talking about hoarding behaviors and their impacts on someone's lives, as well as factors to developing hoarding disorder, criteria for being diagnosed, and how to, help, and how to get help for someone and the evidence-based treatments available. Also, after the webinar, we'll have clinicians available to talk to you one-on-one, -on -one, to listen, lend support, and offer additional resources if you're interested. Um, if you want to talk with somebody, please send us a message through the chat anytime during the webinar and we'll get you connected as soon as the webinar is over. I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, Amy Miller. Amy is, the license, is a licensed clinician and also our Director of Senior Services here at Jefferson Center. Before I hand the mic over to Amy, I do have a few housekeeping items to cover about the presentation. First, the webinar will be available on demand after this live session, and we'll also email that out to you along with additional resources and the slide deck. I would also like to encourage you to visit our website at jcmh.org, where you'll find more information about how to get started if you're interested in talking with a therapist, as well as blog posts and information about upcoming webinars on our other mental health topics. Please keep your microphones muted and turn off your video during the presentation. You'll also wanna change your Zoom view to speaker mode for the best viewing experience. And next, we'd love to hear from you during today's presentation. So if you have, if you have a question for Amy, please feel free to send it through the chat at the bottom of your player. We'll be answering questions at the end of the session, but if we don't get to your question during today's webinar, we'll be sure to follow up afterwards. And finally, we'd like to encourage you to follow us on our social networks and share the recording of this webinar and other information about Jefferson Center. And so without further ado, Amy, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thanks so much, Julia. Yes, welcome everyone. We're gonna be talking about Hoarding disorder today. This has been a, an exciting new service line here at Jefferson Center, and um, it's it's been such a rewarding experience. And we're excited to share some of the things we've learned, as well as you know treatments and and supports and resources that are available to the community. So I'd just like to start off by uh, telling folks about Jefferson Center. We are the Community Mental Health Center for Jefferson, Clear Creek, and Gilpin Counties in Colorado, and we are really here to inspire hope, improve lives, and strengthen our community by providing mental health and other related solutions for individuals and families. And we serve all ages, children up to seniors, the, the program I oversee, as, as well as specialized programs for families, veterans, military personnel. And we offer the traditional individual group family therapy, uh, medication management, but also some really nice wraparound services in terms of wonderful peer specialists who uh, can help walk alongside clients. These are uh, professionals that have experience, lived experience with a mental health condition and they are just a wonderful resource, as well as different classes, uh, resources, school-based services and substance use treatment. So we are here for you and, and please don't hesitate to reach out if we can help. So today we're going to be covering a sort of a broad overview of hoarding disorder. There's certainly a lot of content and more that than can be covered in one hour, um, but we're going to we're going to cover the basics. So covering what it is and how common it is, why people develop it, how to assess for hoarding disorder. You know, where's that line between someone who's maybe a collector or has a lot of clutter versus something that would qualify as a diagnosis for hoarding disorder, uh, what treatment strategies are available that are shown to be effective, and then where to go to learn more. If you're someone with hoarding disorder, if you're someone who cares about someone with a hoarding disorder or possible hoarding disorder, or if you're a professional out in the community, either a mental health professional or a professional that works with individuals in more of a community-based setting, uh, there are additional resources and we will definitely cover where you can go to learn more. I do want to give a special thank you uh, to Dr. Gail Steckety and Dr. Christiana Bradiotis. Uh, a lot of this content came from a presentation they shared at the uh, 2019 International OCD Conferences Hoarding Disorder Meeting, and they have graciously given me permission to share um, a lot of their content. So I uh, just want to really uh, acknowledge them and their good work and uh, thank them for, for making this available to the wider community. So starting off, you know, with, with the basics, what is hoarding disorder? Sometimes this is a term that gets thrown around a lot of, you know, we may jokingly call someone a hoarder if, if they have a lot of stuff in their home or things like that, but, but what does it actually mean in a clinical sense? 
And there's some key features. The first being really persistent difficulty letting go of items because there's this perceived need, there's this feeling that I might need this someday. So it's hard for people with hoarding disorder to let things go because they think they might need it. And you'll notice I'm using the word letting go versus discarding because for folks with hoarding disorder, um, it can feel very harsh and um, kind of emotionally difficult to think of discarding one of their possessions, just letting it go by the wayside. So in our groups, we often use the term letting go of things, letting them go on to their next home, um, because that's, that's a little bit um, more manageable, more tolerable than the idea of just discarding something by the wayside. The thought of getting rid of items causes distress. It causes anxiety or stress at just the thought of, oh, I might need this, I can't get rid of it. And so with that, you get a large accumulation of items. And you often have a mix of things of value. So you will have potentially trash mixed in with something like a valuable antique or um, a check or money. And so it all kind of mixes together. Um, but it's not so much about the value of the items. It used to be thought that only, um, only worthless items could be considered for hoarding disorder. But we know now that hoarding disorder uh, really covers collecting things of, of a wide range of value. And so there's really three key components that feed into the, the final visible result of hoarding disorder, which is clutter. So there's the saving. So having difficulty letting go of things, hanging on to things. Uh, for many people, acquiring is a large part of the equation, going out and either um, getting free things from the curb or from Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace um, or going to the thrift shop or going shopping and bringing excessive amounts of items into the home. And then there's a third component, um, which is really what distinguishes hoarding disorder from someone who might be just a very um, significant collector and have a lot of items, um, is this disorganization piece. A collector will typically keep things pretty well organized and pretty well easy to find and, uh, and manageable. But with hoarding disorder, it tends to all kind of get mixed in together and it's hard for people to find what they're looking for. So that disorganization piece um, is a pretty significant part of hoarding disorder and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. And in terms of the prevalence, it's one of the more common mental health conditions. Um, in the U.S., and this is pretty consistent in the, in the studies around the world that have been done, but in the United States, it's estimated that about 5% of individuals have hoarding disorder. And so that's one in 20 people. I heard we had, you know, 80 people registered for the webinar today. So if, you know, that statistic held true, that would be uh, close to, oh, now I made myself too bad, <laughs> but probably close to about 15 people on the, on the webinar that have hoarding disorder. And if you think of the people you know, um, you probably are here because you know someone with hoarding disorder. So it's very common and it starts early on in life. The average age that symptoms start appearing is age 16. And for many people, it's younger than that. So this is something that appears early on in life and that it tends to, without intervention, tends to get worse over time, which we'll talk more about too. But you see that that moderate to severe hoarding really peaks later in life, around age 50. And this is a chart that sort of describes it, where this is the percentage of different age groups that report moderate to severe hoarding. So you see around age 20, only about 30% of people who meet the criteria for hoarding disorder experience it moderate to severely. Um, about 70%, it's more mild. It's causing issues, but it's not severely impacting their life. And you see how that escalates over time into later life. And that's a big part of the reason that the, the hoarding services ended up in senior services here at Jefferson Center. Um, often, you know, early on in life, kids may have parents that help them manage things. Um, help manage their possessions, help keep their room in line, early adulthood and maybe a spouse or um, other people living in the home. But as people age, more and more stuff accumulates and that's part of why severity increases. Um, but then also as people maybe get divorced or are widowed or start living alone, there's less people around them to sort of keep the levels of clutter in check the way we would expect. And so the diagnostic criteria, um, the, the manual that mental health professionals use is the DSM-5, and that 
latest version came out in 2013. Before that, hoarding disorder was not recognized as a mental illness. And so this really gave us some criteria um, and a diagnosis where we could start providing services that would get reimbursed by insurance. So this was a, a pretty important step. But the criteria for someone to be considered uh, a person with a diagnosis of hoarding disorder is that difficulty discarding or letting go or parting with objects. Uh, that difficulty is due to urges to save. So it's not that, you know, maybe they have some physical limitations that physically make it hard for them to move items around or to, you know, take their trash out or things like that, but it's really this sort of psychological need that's causing that urge to save. These symptoms result in the clutter um, that clutter the living areas of the home. We'll talk a little bit more about that too. And it causes distress or interference in their life. So um, the collecting of items, the saving of items, the clutter that results either causes distress to the person, um, they find it distressing, they're frustrated with themselves, they feel bad about themselves, they're feeling guilt or shame, or it's interfering with their ability to go to work, um, have relationships, go to school, do different activities of daily living. Um, you know, if you can't find the keys to your car because um, it's, it's in a pile of clutter, it can be hard to make it to work on time. If you can't find your homework because it's mixed in in the pile of papers on the desk, it can be hard for school um, to be a successful experience. If your significant other or partner is frustrated with the level of clutter in the house, you know, it can damage interpersonal relationships. And so that's what we're really, um, that's really the key for really any mental health diagnosis is it's causing some sort of distress or impairment in your daily life. Um, but certainly with something like hoarding disorder, that's a, a key distinction. It's not better accounted for by another medical condition. So certain things like, um, autism or um, even something like Alzheimer's can also create some of those collecting behaviors with autism. They often have like fixed interests um, and so they may really get into one particular type of toy or trains or whatever the case might be and so they collect and collect and collect um, and that wouldn't qualify as hoarding disorder. That's something that's more related to the diagnosis of autism. And it's not better accounted for by other mental illnesses. Um, so for example, like with OCD, if you have a compulsion around um, not being able to touch things because you're afraid of contamination. So if you have a contamination phobia and you um, can't get rid of trash because of the fear that you could get germs from the trash from handling it, and so the trash piles up and piles up, that wouldn't qualify as hoarding disorder. That would better be accounted for for OCD. So those are the conditions that have to be present for it to be considered hoarding disorder. These diagnostic specifiers are things that are often present in folks with hoarding disorder, but not always. Um, so the excessive acquisition, so that's where people bring things into the home um, and have a hard time controlling the impulse to acquire things. That's present in 60% of people with hoarding disorder, and then another 28% percent have had that in the past, but either because they physically can't get out of the house as much as they used to, or financially they can't afford to pay for things, or they've um, sort of come up with a coping strategy of I'm just not going to buy more stuff, I'm going to avoid going to the store so that I don't bring more stuff in. They maybe aren't acquiring now, uh, but they have in the past. And so um, only about 8% of folks with hoarding disorder have no level of excessive acquisition, equal either uh, current or past. For those folks, it could be things like mail coming into the house, right? You get a pile of mail and it's just really hard to know where things go. You're worried about making a mistake about how to sort things, what should be shredded, what should be recycled, what should be kept. And so it just never gets dealt with and the mail starts to pile up. That would be an example of passive acquisition where just the things that we need on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of food and mail and things that naturally come into the home, um, even if it's coming in at a slower rate, if nothing ever leaves, that clutter will still ac accumulate. And then level of insight is something that's um, uh, pretty unique with hoarding disorder as well. This refers to the person's understanding that the clutter, um, that the acquiring is a problem. 
And with folks with hoarding disorder, there's parts of the brain that judge the importance of different things. And it's, it's interesting when they're um, looking at their own possessions and trying to decide what to do with them, uh, functional MRIs will often show overactivity in those areas. And so everything seems very, very important. And that's part of why it feels so hard to let go of things. Um, but when they're not looking at things, at their things, at their possessions, often those areas are underactive. And so certain things seem less important to them, including it's not that big of a deal if there's clutter around the house. So that can contribute to that lower level of insight. So often when we're making that diagnosis, we'll specify, you know, good, fair, or poor insight. So what do people with hoarding disorder save? Uh, I'd encourage you to take a moment here and think about the things that you save in your home or the things that tend to accumulate. I know for me, it's my mail. I, I have to set aside a day a week or maybe every two weeks <laughs> to go through and actually sort through and open up mail because I get so much junk mail. Um, but also kitchen gadgets are sort of my vice. I love a good kitchen gadget. I love something that promises to make my life easier. And so I have a kitchen full of stuff. Um, and, and for you, it may be something different, but what the research shows is people with hoarding disorder save the same type of things as people without hoarding disorder. They just save much more of it. Um, so things like magazines, newspapers, right? Many of us can probably relate to having a stack of things we want to read on our, on our side table or on the dining room table, clothes, dishes, containers, uh, things like that. And so what happens is, um, with disorganization, all those things tend to get mixed together, again, regardless of value. So again, with the mail, you know, you may have bills or that stimulus check that came, right, a few months ago, you know, mixed in with trash or food wrappers or things like that because it's, it's hard to know what should go where. That's another sort of functional difference um, in the brains of people with hoarding disorders. Often they have a hard time categorizing what goes together. And so everything often seems so special or so unique that they have a hard time saying, okay, these are bills that need to be paid. These are papers that need to be filed. This is, um, you know, letters I need to respond to. And it all just ends up mixed together. So why do people save or bring stuff into the home? Again, I would encourage you to think about what you why you hang on to things, why you save things. Um, often it's because there's a level of emotional attachment. Um, you know, a, a wedding dress or photo albums or um, a special gift that someone gave to us. It may not have any sort of value to anyone else, but to us, those things can be very, very special and we hang on to them. Also things that are just useful, right? Um, things like kitchen gadgets. <laughs> they're, they're useful. Um, they have an instrumental impact. And so we hang on to them because we use them. Um, but also simply because they're beautiful. There are things that we just appreciate the look of them. Maybe they don't have a function. I'm, I'm looking at, um, you know, a beautiful piece of artwork I was gifted at my last job and I treasured that. Um, and often with hoarding disorder, so many of the challenges are the results of really too much of a good thing. And often folks with hoarding disorder have such a great appreciation for the beauty of things that other people maybe don't recognize. Um, but again, when everything seems beautiful and everything seems special, it's hard to let go of anything. And so it's, it's really just too much of a good thing. Um, but also there are values that tie into why people hang on to things. You know, the, the sense of frugality of, you know, getting a great deal or seeing something for free on the side of the road. I think many of us can relate to, a, to that. But also the idea of bringing something into the home or paying for something and then it doesn't get used, maybe because there's no space or the person can't find it or they just didn't use it the way they, they thought they would. Um, it feels uh, very wasteful often to let rid, let go of those items if they never got used. So that sense of frugality, again, too much of a good thing just gets taken to an extreme oftentimes. Uh, creativity, often people can think of many, many uses uh, for an item. Um, so, you know, I might have an empty tissue box, right? Once I use this all up and, and I might think, well, this is garbage now, I'm gonna, you know, recycle it or throw it in the trash. Um, but someone with hoarding, decider, hoarding disorder could probably think of many 
uses for this. It could hold um, shopping bags. It could be a pen holder. It, you know, it could be a cat toy or many other things. And so when everything seems like it could be so useful, it seems like a waste um, to not do that. And then that level of resourcefulness too, of, um, you know, not wanting to run out of things, wanting to have something when we need it. I think many of us could relate to this at the beginning of the pandemic. That's why there was no toilet paper, right? We want to have things when we need it. And so again, they're resourceful. They go out, they find things, they make do. Um, but it's just, again, taken to an extreme that often it's hard for them to let go of the things even after they're no longer useful. Oop. Okay. So it is common for folks with hoarding disorder to experience other mental health concerns. Uh, the most common is major depressive disorder. More than half of folks with hoarding disorder also have major depressive disorder. And that can be really challenging because we know depression can really sap that motivation, judgment, decision making. Um, it can affect a lot of the, the skills and things that are needed to effectively address hoarding disorder. Um, similarly with anxiety, about a quarter of people with hoarding disorder either have generalized anxiety disorder or social anxiety disorder. And often the items around them, their possessions, can help soothe that anxiety and relieve that anxiety. Um, interesting, interestingly, uh, many people with hoarding disorder also have an ADHD diagnosis, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, about 27%. And, um, you know, this is certainly shown to be true in, in the folks that are attending our groups. And it makes sense because that difficulty focusing and staying on task and making decisions um, makes it hard to sort through things, to declutter things. And so often those go hand in hand too. Interestingly, the incidence of trauma in people with hoarding disorder. And this is one thing that on the TV shows, they often like to feature some sort of traumatic event that happened in the person's life and kind of, you know, hold that up as the reason they started hoarding. Uh, but really what we know is the incident of trauma in people with hoarding disorder is the same as the general population. But folks with hoarding disorder actually have a lower prevalence of PTSD. So there does seem to be some sort of comforting, protective effect of their items and it does you know provide them some comfort and some relief for many um, PTSD symptoms and that's a big reason why if we can avoid doing a big clean out all at once we want to do that because their stuff serves a purpose and so if, if we take that away before they have other coping skills in place we may actually be causing more harm than good um, you know sometimes it's necessary and we'll get into that a little bit later um, but it does have a function and I, I want to make sure um, that's clear. So, um, you know, about three quarters of people have some sort of anxiety or mood disorder other than OCD in addition to their hoarding disorder. And that might seem overwhelming, but the good news is addressing one often helps the other. And we've seen this in our group, whereas people um, are able to more effectively manage their possessions, it builds the sense of autonomy and efficacy and, and um, empowerment that they can do things and they can, they can address this issue and that translates to other parts of their life. And so it gives us an opportunity for, for multiple venues of intervention. So there's often the question of why people hoard. And often people will want to say something like, well, their, their mother, um, was a was a clutter bug or a pack rat, or they lived through the depression, and we or like in the TV shows they they had a trauma, and you know certainly those things can can feed into that. But we also know people who have parents who hoard don't always go on to hoard. We know people who grew up in the depression that didn't have a cluttered home, um, so it's not as as simple as one factor, and that's frustrating. Our brains want to have the one thing that caused that caused the issue, um, but really it's, it's complex. So, you know, evolutionarily speaking, back, you know, in prehistoric times, there wasn't a target around the corner and Amazon didn't have, you know, two day 
free shipping and you know things were hard to come by and so it was natural to hang on to the things you came across that were useful um, that were beautiful that had a sentimental attachment because you may not come across something like that so it was really a survival strategy that just doesn't translate to our new modern uh, world where uh, there's there's stuff everywhere we turn biology and neurobiology certainly there seems to be um, you know with genetics as well a family component certain people seem to be more hardwired um, to experience hoarding disorder um, and there's different brain functions or the, the brain functions a little bit differently in folks with hoarding disorder and that's not to say it's it's bad or you know that their brains that there's something wrong with them they just function a little bit differently we all all of our brains function a little differently from each other and with hoarding disorder you know again it's it's the part of the brains that often relate to judgment and um, understanding the importance of things and you know those those areas can either be overactive or underactive in the situation um, you know certainly as people age and maybe they have more cognitive challenges if it's something related to you know mild cognitive impairment um, some of those executive function difficult executive functioning difficulties like attention, decision making, being able to organize and categorize things um, can make it harder to manage their possessions, which is also why um, hoarding disorder tends to get worse over time. And then older adults in particular often struggle with, with complex thinking and what we call prospective memory. So that memory that says, I need to remember to do this. I need to remember to pay that bill. I need to remember to call so-and-so. And so often they'll leave different items out as a way to try to help jog their memory. Um, but when all those things start to mix together, it, it doesn't, um, doesn't work as intended. So in terms of how to sort of screen and assess for hoarding disorder, there's a lot of really good evidence-based assessments out there. The hoarding rating scale is available online. Um, so if, if you're a mental health professional or someone who works like in a, a housing building or senior housing building, you know, this is, these are questions you could certainly ask of someone. Um, you know, because of the clutter, how difficult it, is it for you to use the rooms in your home? Uh, to what extent do you have difficulty letting go of ordinary things that other people would get rid of? Do you currently have a problem with collecting free things or buying more things than you need or that you can use or afford? Uh, to what extent do you experience emotional distress because of clutter, difficulty discarding, or problems with buying or acquiring things? And to what extent do you experience impairment in your daily life? Again, the things we were talking about, daily routine, job or school, social activities, family activities, financial difficulties, because of clutter, difficulty discarding, or problems with buying or acquiring things. And so if, if you have a good rapport with the person and you can, you know, have a, a good, open, respectful conversation with them, this can be really helpful in terms of gauging. Um, there's the, the scoring is online as well, but in general, a total score of 14 or higher is the cutoff score for hoarding disorder. Um, so if they're averaging about a three, um, again, it can be mild, it could be a mild hoarding disorder, but if they're averaging a three or above, um, that tends to indicate the potential for hoarding disorder. So that's certainly one way to assess. Now, if, if you're in a situation where maybe the person isn't as open to talking about um, their clutter or their struggles, there is another way you can assess, and this is the clutter image rating scale. These are also available online. There's even an app you can download. So if this is something you might find yourself using a lot, um, you can you can download that. But this is um, really helpful. It's also helpful if you see the client not in their home, right? So if you're a mental health professional and the person is coming to the office or you're only seeing them by Zoom, you could show them this and people are pretty good at accurately describing their home situation. Again, they may not think it's a big deal if, if they're someone with hoarding disorder with low insight, um, but they can usually pretty accurately describe the level of clutter in their home. Um, and really we're looking at the bedroom, the kitchen, and the living room. Uh, we Really when it comes to hoarding disorder, we're not looking at things like garages, um, basements that aren't meant to be living space, attics, right? Those are sort of natural, um, storage spaces so if someone's attic is packed you know it may be causing challenges but as long as the living areas are still functional it wouldn't necessarily um, 
be considered hoarding disorder. Um, so you can, you've probably been looking at these pictures and everyone's like, where's, where's the cutoff? You know, so for the average population, they're usually around a, a 1.5 in these different pictures, you know, a little bit of clutter. Um, for someone who's at a four or above, that really indicates uh, probable hoarding disorder and, and a need for clinical intervention. Um, or if not hoarding disorder, maybe something like major depressive disorder, where they just don't have the energy to clean their room, and so things tend to pile up. So uh, it may not be hoarding disorder, but four or above certainly indicates the need for clinical attention. Uh, similarly for the kitchen, four or above, so you can see the this stack of newspapers on that right hand side start to grow, things on the counter, things on the floor, uh, surfaces on the table starting to get um, more and more possessions. And then the living room. Um, and it was interesting, they created this with a group of grad students, they got some funding to do it. And so they would put like staples boxes <laughs> and then add stuff over the top. And Gail Steckety, who uh, created this, said the only thing she would do different is often the clutter has more of like a bowl shape, like a concave shape, as opposed to being a big mound. Things tend to pile up against the walls instead of in the middle of the room. Um, but beyond that, it's, it's still shown to be very accurate. So um, people still can can pretty easily and consistently identify their level of clutter um, and it's, it's accurate when a professional goes in and, and does the same level of assessment. So there certainly are options for intervention. There are things that can help. And with this slide, we're really going from an ideal situation to a less than ideal but sometimes necessary intervention. Um, so sort of best case scenario at the top, down a worst case scenario, um, but certainly when there's a safety issue or when there's kids in the home or when, um, you know, potentially maybe animals are being hoarded, you know, sometimes there's, a, there's intervention that needs to happen without the person's consent, but the first step, if at all possible, is always to have, you know, a supportive, slow, <laughs> consistent, step-by-step -step reduction of clutter. Um, so we really want the person to learn some of the new skills they need to be able to manage the clutter in their home, and that takes time. It's, it's really unlearning a lifetime of thought processes and um, decision-making skills, and it's a whole new way of thinking about their items. And so it, it takes time. And so ideally, there's some sort of behavioral coach. It doesn't have to be a mental health professional. Um, you know, there are uh, professional organizers, uh, certified professional organizers, CPOs, that specialize in what they call chronic disorganization. Um, so they can be a great resource, but really anyone, uh, care managers, um, you know, family members, if, if you can, <laughs> if you're, you can have the patience and um, respect the person's autonomy, that these are their possessions and they get to make the choice about what happens, you know, having that coach to help them think through um, whether or not to keep something, to ask questions about, you know, how likely is that you'll get to use this, things like that. And to keep them focused on the task at hand, especially if there's someone with maybe a co-occurring ADHD diagnosis, it can be really hard for them to stay focused on clearing this one tabletop or this one chair. Um, so having someone to keep them on task can be helpful. But certainly uh, mental health treatment is, is important and has its place, especially when there's a co-occurring mental health diagnosis. So there is a, a form of treatment called specialized CBT for hoarding. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and CBT is really the gold standard because so much of um, the clutter results from uh, sort of inaccurate or unhelpful thoughts about the person's possession. So the idea that I might need this someday, or um, I got such a great deal, I don't want to let go of it. Having someone who's really skilled at challenging some of those thoughts in a, in a supportive and respectful way um, helps people learn to think differently about their items. There's uh, group treatment options, which is something we've started at Jefferson Center as well. We'll talk more about. Um, Community-led interventions. Um, one of the great things about uh, the group we've started is anyone can facilitate it. Um, it was actually the, the facilitator's manual was written by, uh, co-written by Randy Frost, who's um, out of Boston as well, and um, a psychologist and, and really 
between him and Gail Steckety, they're like the people, um, the experts on hoarding disorder. So Randy Frost and um, Lee Shure, who is a gentleman who has hoarding disorder and is in recovery and, and continues to work on it, they together created this buried and treasures model. So it's designed to be led by someone with hoarding disorder or really, um, you know, anyone out in the community. It's, it's a really well written well-written uh, facilitator guide. So we'll talk a little bit more about that, but um, there's certainly options if if you don't have a mental health professional, you know, in your area that specializes in this, there, there are other options, um, including bibliotherapy, books you can read, and I've got a list at the end. Um, sometimes harm reduction strategies is, is the best intervention. You know, we may not be able to convince the person to, you know, get rid of the majority of their possessions. But if we can explain that, you know, we need to have three foot pathways so that if there's a medical emergency or if there's a fire, people can get in and out of the home. Um, we don't wanna have flammable objects on top of the stove. We want the heating vents to be free of clutter so that there's proper ventilation and air circulation. So if we can, um, you know, together create a plan that keeps the home environment safe, that's a win, that's a, that's a worthwhile intervention. And then from there, they may make more progress or they may not, um, but if at least we can ensure that safety, that's, that's a huge gain. So there may come a point where, um, you know, because of the clutter, maybe the home falls into disrepair. Um, often what will happen is a refrigerator will stop working or there will be a plumbing issue. And because of the embarrassment around the clutter, um, people with hoarding disorder will not want repairmen to come into the home. And so things can stop functioning properly. And so at a certain point, it gets to be too much for one person. And if there's health and safety concerns, um, you know, often they can't address things like plumbing or electrical issues on their own. So having a supported clean out where the client is there and has a support person, a, you know, a, a family member who's had some training or a mental health professional to help um, be part of the process, to have some control over the process, um, but also help them you know, emotionally manage the stress of, of having things leave the home, um, you know, that can sometimes be the intervention that's needed. Sometimes that's too challenging and the person um, can't just can't manage the anxiety of seeing their things leave. And so sometimes they they cannot be there for their own mental health. And so, um, again, if we can involve them in the process, that tends to be better. But if that's not possible and they, they choose not to, um, sometimes the clean out without the client there is the option we need to go with. And then, um, you know, eventually if it gets to be too extreme and, and the person is refusing any level of service, um, it can lead to eviction and, and even homelessness. So this is definitely a situation where if we can intervene early, <laughs> ideally with the clients, um, buy-in that's the best and, and we'll talk about some ways to have some of those conversations and encourage people to um, to engage in treatment but I do just want to re-emphasize the research shows that cleanouts don't actually work um, this was a study that was um, looking at the results of cleanouts of 62 older adults of their home and what they found is 15% of the time there was sustained improvement. The level of clutter, you know, stayed stayed low in the home. 8% um, of the time there was some initial improvement, but eventual relapse where where stuff started coming back into the home after a period of improvement. 43% uh, of the time there was no change. The level of clutter went right back to where it was before the clean out. And in 15% of cases, the clutter actually got worse. Um, often if people feel you know, that attached to items and it's that traumatic for things to leave, um, again, people acquire items, hang on to items because it makes them feel better. And so sometimes it can actually make the clutter worse. So it sometimes has to happen for health or safety reasons, but it's not the go-to intervention. Um, it's just harder to make a TV show <laughs> with, with, you know, years and years of, of weekly psychotherapy. So the cleanouts have that nice before and after effect um, that we like to see. 
So in terms of the, the specialized CBT for hoarding, you know, really we want to look at the whole picture for the person. Did they grow up in poverty? Did they have family members who hoarded? Did they experience something traumatic? Because that's going to guide how we intervene. You know, perhaps they need to have trauma treatment to address their PTSD symptoms so that they're not so reliant on the clutter that's around them to soothe them or provide that sense of safety. Um, there's techniques for enhancing motivation and really with this and, and as a, a family member or community member, what we want to do is we don't want to brush over the challenges or gloss over the challenges um, that the clutter causes. And part of it is, is bringing attention in a gentle and respectful way um, to the challenges. So saying things like, wow, it must be really hard that your daughter feels like she can't bring her kids here because it's not safe. That must be really hard. And just reflecting back, not saying, oh, she's overreacting or, oh, that's no big deal or, oh, you can see them elsewhere, but like really acknowledging the pain that it's caused because it's not until the discomfort of our present behaviors becomes greater than the fear of changing that we actually make any change. And that's true for substance abuse, that's true for smoking, that's true for overeating. There's gotta be something that triggers a level of discomfort or pain that is greater, that, that overrides that fear of doing something different. And so part of motivational interviewing is not shaming or guilting, but just like acknowledging the reality of, wow, this is a tough situation. It, you know, I'm scared that you might fall trying to go to the bathroom. I'm, I'm kind of worried about you. Do you ever worry about that? And just asking some of those gentle questions that can help bring attention to, yeah, this is actually pretty challenging. We want to give people strategies for reducing their acquiring. So often we'll have um, clients create a list of questions um, that they can take with them to the store. So things like, how many of these do I already have? Um, is this unique enough to add to my collection? Will bringing this home help my hoarding problem? That's one that tends to be really powerful for people. So finding ways to reduce that urge to acquire and also finding other pleasurable activities that they can do instead of going shopping so that there's another way for them to get, um, you know, those, those feel good <laughs> hormones that our brain tends to spurt out when we do something pleasurable. Giving them some cognitive skills around organizing, problem solving. Okay, so you, you're worried you might need this can opener. Um, and that the first two can openers that you have won't work and you'll need this third one. You know, so say that happens and you, you need a can opener and you don't have this one. How could you um, solve that problem? You know, helping them think through some other strategies for solving their problems beyond hanging on to the item. Uh, part of the treatment includes practicing letting go of things. Often there's the fear that if I let go of this, I won't be able to stop thinking about it and it's going to be so stressful, I will never recover. And that's, that's a genuine fear. And so often we, we talk about doing an experiment where we let go of an item and we say, okay, so write down how long you think you'll be thinking about this item. Write down where your stress level is from a zero to ten. And then we'll check in 15 minutes later and say, okay, I want you to think back. Um, are you still thinking about that item? And where's your stress level at now? And often it decreases much more quickly than the person anticipates. So once they start to, to learn and experience that the stress and anxiety of letting something go doesn't last forever, it becomes easier to let go of other things. Um, challenging beliefs through different cognitive therapy strategies. Again, thinking through, um, well, is this special? Is this really unique? How many of these do you have? Um, what about this particular collection of items? So say you collect spoons. You know, what's most important to you in your spoon collection? Um, and maybe it's from certain states or um, I want one from every state. And okay, well, you have three from Colorado. Which one do you like the best? and helping them kind of think through and challenge the beliefs that, no, I need every single spoon because they're so special. And then having strategies to maintain their gains and prevent um, relapse. So again, with, with something like a clean out, you know, there's a lot of progress very quickly, but if there's not strategies in place to help them maintain um, and, and keep working on the incoming stuff. Again, because even if people aren't going out and acquiring things, things like mail and food and clothing tend to still come into the home. So how do we manage that so that we don't get back to a place of excessive clutter? 
but really the, the community support is critical. Um, again, this is a situation that affects multiple systems, housing, social services, um, hauling services, health care, family, peers, certainly mental health treatment, um, and it can impact multiple people. That's, that's something that's sort of unique about hoarding disorder, you know, with something like depression or anxiety, someone can often hide it um, quite well, and people may not even be aware that they're experiencing it. But with hoarding, there's this very external, visible um, symptom of, of clutter and that does impact the people who live with them and it can impact their neighbors and the community um, so really we this is a group effort and it's it's been great to collaborate with you know some of the local police departments and uh, Jeffco code enforcement and just to have an option so that you know if someone you know, us mental health professionals are generally not going out to people's homes and, and coming across people. We, you know, we are waiting for people to come to us or be sent to us. And so the people who have the eyes and ears on the community can really be that bridge into treatment. Um, but again, we want to avoid shaming language or, you know, telling people uh, things like, oh, I can't believe this has gotten this bad, or how can you live like this, or, you know, sometimes we think that shaming language will motivate people, and it does not. It actually does the opposite effect. People get defensive and dig their heels in even more. Um, so again, it's, it's offering those, you know, reflections of, you know, I can see this is, this is pretty cluttered in here, and I'm worried about your safety. I'm wondering if I can, um, put you in touch with some folks I know that have worked with people who experience um, clutter like this. And, um, and then likewise too, when you see that the person has made an effort, has made progress, um, reinforcing that, praising that. Um, so often we'll hear, you know, people say, you know, I, I cleaned off the table so my family could have dinner. And all I heard was, well, it's about time. And well, why didn't you clean off this part too? And, um, you know, and, and the person's made a positive step, but has gotten shamed for it. And, and that's not how we reinforce behavior change. So really offering praise for the efforts, for the changes that you see. Um, and then just, just being that non-judgmental, respectful, um, person that that can you know just have an honest conversation about the impacts this is having on that person's life. Um, so there's some great books out there. I've got a stack right here, so I'll show you so you can see. Um, the first one is called Stuff. It's by uh, oh that's misspelled Gail St Steckity and uh, Randy Frost. So um, this is great if you're just interested in more about hoarding disorder and sort of how it came about and, and the origins um, and sort of a, a nice good overview. Um, for therapists, there's these Treatment That Work series um, that are put out in collaboration with SAMHSA. So there's a handbook on treatment for hoarding disorder that's great for therapists. Uh, the Hoarding Handbook, a guide for human service professionals, would be great for someone like adult protective services workers or housing authority workers. Um, this is really for those um, members of the community who are often working with clients with hoarding disorder but may or may not be in a place where they can actually address it themselves. So the Hoarding Handbook is great for that. Uh, Buried in Treasures, great book uh, for people with hoarding disorder or for anyone who just um, you know, it's a great read for mental health professionals as well. There's different exercises you can try with your clients. Similarly for families, just to get a better understanding of why people hoard and how to support someone who hoards. Um, so the Spirit and Treasures book is, is also what the group we do is based on, and it's an excellent resource. Um, Decluttering at the Speed of Life. This is written by a woman, Dana White, who struggled with clutter. I don't know that she would necessarily have met the criteria for hoarding disorder, um, but she sort of uh, provides the strategies that have been helpful for her in getting rid of the excessive clutter. She has a blog, and I think actually the digital copy of this is like $1.99 today. So if you have a Kindle or a Nook or e-reader, um, it's on sale today. But this is great if, if you know maybe you're someone who struggles with clutter and you, you're not wanting, you know, the preachy, <laughs> the preachy therapist, or it feels like it would be preachy to have, you know, the expert book out there. This is from someone who's been there, done that, experienced it. So I think that can be a great resource. And then the last one that fell off is called Digging Out. 
And this is great for family members of people with hoarding disorder, how to support them, how to set boundaries, how to do some harm reduction strategies. Um, and actually the author of, of this book is gonna be at the online hoarding training that I'm gonna mention here in a little bit. So the workshop um, that I mentioned, we, we have it here at Jefferson Center, but um, the facilitator's manual is available online. So if you, um, again, if you are living in an apartment building and you know there's a few people that struggle, struggle with clutter, you could self-lead a Buried in Treasures workshop. Um, it's certainly helpful to have a mental health professional who's, um, you know, got some training in using the CBT techniques and motivational interviewing strategies, um, but it's not required. And, and the research shows that even groups led by non-professionals have good outcomes. So I would definitely encourage you to, to either look for a workshop in your area or think about starting one yourself. Um, in terms of finding local resources, the International OCD Foundation is really um, the go-to place for resources. And um, the reason it's the International OCD Foundation is because for a long time, hoarding disorder was sort of lumped in with OCD. There was a thought that there was the compulsion to save or the obsession with, choir, with acquiring. Um, but research since then, including scans of the brain shows that it's it's a pretty distinct diagnosis both based on level of insight um, people with ocd consistently know that it's a problem and it consistently causes distress whereas with hoarding disorder sometimes you have that low insight where people don't think it's a big deal and they don't know why everyone's on their case um, but then also just the the different brain functions and where um, how different parts of the brain are functioning is different between OCD and hoarding disorder. But that's sort of where, where the work around hoarding disorder grew up. And so they often, um, so they also have great resources. So you can find a provider um, based on your insurance, based on your location, um, who has training in working with hoarding disorder. Um, they have a, a conference every year. It was supposed to be in Seattle this year, and of course that's not happening, um, but they've shifted it to an online training, and so the link is extremely long, um, and I know we're going to be sending that out in a follow-up email. You could also just Google IOCDF, you know, annual hoarding disorder meeting. Um, it's coming up next weekend, Friday, um, August 14th, that evening, they're going to screen a movie. And then Saturday, August 15th, um, will be the day of webinars. And there's a track for professionals, there's a track for people with hoarding disorder, and there's sessions specifically for family members. And it's the people who have written all the books. Like, these are the experts, and you have access to them. I went to the, the in-person um, conference last year in Austin, and it was phenomenal. They are so supportive and respectful, and there's not a lot of people doing work on hoarding disorder, so they are eager to share their knowledge and their information with you. Um, it's $25 for community members, uh, $75 if you're a healthcare professional that wants the continuing education credits, um, but I would highly encourage you, if, if this is something that's impacting your life or you want to learn more about, that is a fantastic resource that's coming up very quickly. So, I want to uh, give a shout out to the Jefferson Center Speakers Bureau. Again, that's where we are able to offer community education like this. And so it's a free service that we provide to our community as part of our mission as a nonprofit. Um, all presentations are given by a licensed mental health professional and we have a variety of topics, everything on managing anxiety, building resilience, um, topics related to raising kids and parenting and managing with COVID dealing with social isolation. There's, there's a broad range of existing topics and presentations we have on deck. And then we can certainly custom create something if, if there's a group um, you'd like us to come present to. Um, so some different ways to stay involved. Um, certainly uh, going to our website, jcmh.org slash get involved. Um, donations are always appreciated, especially in this time of COVID. We're, we're all doing more with less. So um, your financial contributions uh, help support programs like this. Uh, attending a mental health first aid class, attending one of our other webinars or online events uh, would just encourage you to do that. So this is my contact information. Uh, you are certainly welcome to email me if you have questions, if uh, you're interested in our next Buried in Treasures group. It's a six-month group, um, so we, we don't offer it um, 
very often because it, it runs for quite a long time. Really treatment for hoarding disorder usually takes a minimum of nine to 12 months to have a lasting impact. So we have many people who are coming through the group uh, twice. Um, but if that's something you might be interested in or if you have additional questions, you know, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm always happy to, to field those and uh, provide any information that I can to be helpful. Uh, so with that, I see we have a few minutes for questions and answers, so I would be happy to take any if you um, want to put those in the chat box. Uh, we'll, we'll go through those now. Amy, thank you so much. Um, we do have a couple of questions, but before we get to them, I want to remind everyone that if you want to talk one-on-one -on -one with the therapist to ask questions or get resources, uh, you can send a private message to us in the chat and we'll get you connected in a few minutes once um, the webinar is over. Um, so Amy, like I said, we do have a couple of questions. So the first one we got was, um, so the first one we got was, um, do you frequently find compulsive shopping as a part of this disorder? Yes, that would tie in with that excessive acquiring, which again is about 60% um, of people with hoarding disorder. So um, definitely in our group, uh, the group members will often <laughs> describe it as the acquiring frenzy, right? They get into the store, they see an amazing deal, and it's like it hijacks their brain. And this is how they describe it. It hijacks their brain and they can't stop thinking about it and they have to have it until it comes home with them. And then often they get it home and they're discouraged or they're frustrated or they're, they don't know what to do with it. And so that, that piece can be frustrating, you know, after the rush is gone, but certainly in the moment, you know, it, it can be very, very um, powerful that, that desire to acquire. So that's part of the workshop is, is learning to go in often with the support buddy at first and um, before COVID, you know, there was an exercise where you could go with someone else in the group and support each other in not acquiring, going into the store and walking out of the store without anything. Because we all need to shop. We need to buy groceries. We need to buy clothes. Like those are, those are things that are necessities and we can't avoid them forever. So part of the group's goal is to help people, um, again, have some strategies so that they can think through purchases in a thoughtful way rather than kind of getting hijacked by that acquiring frenzy. Great. Um, and our next question is, if you have two hoarders in the same home, is treatment better performed individually or as a couple? And how do you get them both on the same page, uh, you know, reducing clutter at the same time? Yeah, that can be really challenging. Um, <laughs> I would say go with go with what you can get. If you can get both people on board, that's fantastic. Um, if not, if there's one person who's a little bit more motivated, I would start with them. What we want to avoid is is the finger pointing that can happen in those situations where, um, you know, say it's a husband and a wife and the husband will say, well, it's all her stuff. Her stuff's causing, you know, all the clutter. She needs to get rid of it. My stuff is fine. And the wife might say the same thing about the husband. And so um, part of it is, is, you know, helping them have a conversation about, okay, I'm going to own <laughs> the responsibility I have for my possessions. I can't force them to do anything they don't want to do. I can't force them to get rid of anything. All I can do is manage my own responsibility and maybe I'll, I'll be a good example or maybe it will inspire them to want to, to work on their stuff. Maybe it won't. I don't have any control over that. Um, but I, I, I am going to own the part of, of the problem that I am contributing to. So it, it's definitely challenging and it can be kind of the self-reinforcing cycle, but I would say if you can get both on board, great. If not, go with, go with the person who's willing to work with you. Great, and our next question is, um, could you talk a little bit about if there's free or low, low cost services that people can access for clutter removal? And uh, to tack on to that, do you have advice for funding to assist people with cleaning? Yeah, absolutely. So um, there is some funding, at least in the Denver metro area, from, the, from Dr. Cog, the Denver Regional Council of Governments, um, which houses the Area Agency on Aging. So the Area Agency on Aging has provided some funding for clutter cleanouts. And so Seniors Resource Center, if you go to SRC, Seniors Resource Center, aging, Dot org has funding to help with clutter cleanouts. Um, so that's a fantastic resource that's made a huge difference. Um, what was the second part of that question? 
Um, it was mainly about like what what are some services that offer water awesome. removal? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for those questions, I would definitely refer you to your local area agency on aging. So Dr. Cog has their own um, information and assistance line because part of the Older Americans Act funding, at least if you're 60 plus, um, is is given to the area agency on aging to provide services to older adults in the community so they often have um, subcontractors that can help with cleaning and housekeeping and things like that and jeffco seniors resource center is often the one we refer to um, but your local area agency on aging can let you know what programs are available in your area great um, the next question we got was, um, are there other mental health providers in the Denver metro area that offer similar support groups and services? Um, because Jefferson Center services Jefferson County, Gilpin, and Clear Creek. So how would I help someone outside of that service area? Yeah, I mean, it's tough. It's, there are not a lot of us out there and that was part of the reason Jefferson Center decided to to put the money and the effort and the the staff power into creating the service line is that there's not a lot in the Denver metro area I would refer you back to the International OCD Foundation website um, and you can list um, or you can search I, I there are a handful I will say I think there's a couple in Lakewood um, maybe one up in the like the Boulder Broomfield Louisville area um, but that search tool is going to have the most up-to-date information um, and will help you find the person who's who's closest to you that can work with your insurance and things like that but yeah it's it's a very underserved diagnosis partially because it wasn't actually a diagnosis and there was no way to get reimbursed for treatment um, until until the DSM-5 came out in 2013. So it's, um, you know, there's still a lot we're learning about it. There's still a lot in terms of services that, um, that are lacking, uh, especially in, you know, rural areas, but even here in the Denver Metro, there's not a lot. So um, it's, it's a work in progress, but that website's a great resource. And Amy, too, I know we've been doing a lot with telehealth and virtual appointments. So is that an option, too, for people um, who might live outside of our service area? If they wanted help from Jefferson Center, could they get virtual help? Yeah, if it's specific to hoarding disorder, I'd encourage you to, to send me an email. Um, with Jefferson Center, we are the mental health center for those three counties. And so those are our priority areas. Um, but again, since there is... A, um, a scarcity of professionals working with folks with hoarding disorder, I'd encourage you um, to email me and we can certainly, you know, try to set something up. Telehealth has been great. We've been able to do Zoom sessions. That's how we're doing our current Buried and Treasures group. Um, people are Zooming in and um, it's it's been really great in a lot of ways. We can actually do some um, you know, in-person decluttering sessions and and um, do some work in the moment as opposed to when someone comes into our office. So that certainly has expanded some options. Um, and then, yeah, if you're outside our regular service area, just send me an email and uh, and we'll figure out what the right path is for you. Great, thank you. Um, I think we have time for maybe one or two more quick questions. So we did have somebody ask, is uh, hoarding disorder hereditary? There is definitely a genetic component. So it's it's similar to really, you know, if you think of any sort of condition, whether that's heart disease or depression or, um, you know, diabetes, there's a genetic component. And so certainly, you know, a hereditary factor can increase the risk of someone developing hoarding disorder, but it's not a, a guarantee that just because a parent had it, you know, the, the child is gonna develop it. So, um, you know, and then there's also some pieces that are hard to separate from the genetics, right? If, if you grew up in the home with your biological parents, they may also have some learned behaviors around keeping things and saving things. And so it's a behavior you've learned as opposed to a genetic um, kind of trait that you've inherited. Um, so there's a I don't love using gun metaphors, but, you know, there's sort of this expression for a lot of different conditions that genetics loads the gun and your environment pulls the trigger. And that certainly seems to be true for hoarding disorder. There's a genetic component that can make you more vulnerable. And then something like trauma or learned behaviors around saving or growing up in poverty or different things like that can make it more likely that that genetic um, risk factor will express itself. Great. And one, uh, one final question, um, is collecting food considered hoarding? 
Great question. Oh boy, and don't, didn't all of us go out and buy a bunch of pasta and rice <laughs> and canned food during the pandemic? Yeah, this is a great question. So again, um, it comes down to is, is collecting that food having a negative impact? So can you financially afford the food you're buying? Do you have a place to store it? Or is it starting to creep into other uh, living areas and making those areas unusable? Um, are you using, are you collecting more than you can use? Is it going bad before you're able to eat it? Um, those are, are kind of the two main factors is can you afford it? Do you have a place to store it? And are you eating it in a timely manner before it goes bad? And if, you know, if those three areas are covered, it's probably not considered hoarding. Um, the other piece too, and again, this is sort of what makes hoarding disorder unique from something like a collector, is with hoarding disorder, it's all types of objects that tend to be collected. Whereas with a collector, you know, you might, um, maybe, maybe you experienced hunger as a child or as an adult for that matter. And there's a comfort that having a lot of food gives you but other items you don't have that level of attachment to. And the food isn't getting in the way of your relationships, your ability to use your home, things like that. So, um, or a collector might be really into collecting, you know, model cars or model airplanes or, um, you know, mugs or whatever the case might be. But if those collections aren't causing, you know, financial distress and they're not encroaching on the ability to use the living areas of the home, um, you know, then it's, then it wouldn't really fall into hoarding disorder. So um, there's that piece too. If it's just the food, it, it seems to me less likely to be hoarding disorder, um, but potentially, potentially that would, that would take a, a little more assessment to tease out specifically. Great. Well, Amy, thank you so much for um, the presentation today. And thank you, everybody who's attended. Um, just to end, no matter what you're facing in life, like if you're feeling overwhelmed, worried, or stressed, Jefferson Center is here for you. We are open, accepting new clients, and accessing care is easier than ever with virtual appointments. You can visit our website at jcmh.org or follow us on Facebook for more resources and information. You can also reach us by calling 303-425-0300. Thank you, everybody, and have a great day.